bless you. If you get your outlines out with me this morning, the message today is entitled, Getting Off the Fence. How many of you know that it's very difficult if, to navigate if you were to walk on top of a fence, if not impossible? And so I want to talk about that in a spiritual sense because some people kind of in their faith kind of ride the fence in between maybe one foot in the world and one foot in a relationship with the Lord. And so I want to talk about getting off the fence. Look at the very first verse on your outline with me this morning. It's found in Matthew chapter 12 in verse 30 and it says this, He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. And so what he's saying here is you're either for me or you're against me. And so we can't have it both ways. What we tend to do in life, if you can uh, imagine a, a pizza with pepperoni, no, but a, a pizza, and, and that represents your whole life. And, and sometimes what we do, we put our life in slices where we'll, we'll say, you know, th this is my work slice, and, and this is my... Uh, you know, recreational slice, and, and this is my kind of God slice, and we kind of put it in slices, when the truth is, God owns the whole thing, and our whole lives should center around that, and so, but a lot of times what we do is, we can maybe, you know, have one foot in the world, and have one foot in our relationship with the Lord, and it never works, and so that's what he's saying, and I, I think we live in changing times consistently. In fact, things are always changing. I mean, you know, life is always changing. Some changes are harmless, and all we need to do is to adapt or to adjust in our lives. But what do we do when morality loosens, when families decline, when things are going from bad to worse? What do we do then? And it seems like people tend to just throw out the old for the new. And a lot of times what happens in our lives, as we live in, I believe, the last days, I believe we live in a, in a, in a place where we no longer live in what's called black and white. There seems to be, be no more constants in our life. It's like there's many shades of gray, but no black and white. And even our world recognizes that. And there's blurred lines, which is a popular song. And I believe the enemy wants to do that. There, there's no absolutes anymore. The things that used to be wrong now are right and accepted. And so we live in that type of changing world, don't we? Where we see morals and different things declining and values tend to change. And that's why it's so important, I think, that we talk about this. Because what's interesting is we have three choices. As times get tough, we can either give up. Two, we can choose to blend in with our world and our society. Or we can get stronger in our faith and be more like Jesus Christ. And so you know the answer to that. But listen to this. Of all the times in which you were born... The Lord has a plan and a purpose that you were born right now in this time frame. You could have been born in any, any era, but you're born now. And I think that's revel, it's relevant to us because, again, I believe we live in the last days. I believe we see the book of Revelation and Matthew unfold before our eyes. And so I believe the Lord has us here to be an anchor, to be salt and light to a world that is very dark. And so as we go through this journey called life in a world that's going through changing times, the goal of the service today is to remind us of what our time on earth is for so that you and I can decide how to conduct our lives in these last days. Look at the second verse on your outline found in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 1 through 5. He says this, but realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, 
unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossip, without self-control, brutal, haters of, say it with me, good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to the form of godliness, although they have denied its power, and it says, and void such men as these. Again, these are the characteristics of people in the last days. Are we seeing any of these? Yeah, we're, we're trending towards all these things as we see in our society. That's why it's important. He gives the characteristics of what's taking place, and we can see that right before our eyes. Boy, have times have changed. I can remember a time, actually, I don't remember, but I remember my parents talking about this, when Lucy and Ricky went into the bedroom at the same time, right? And I think they had two separate beds, but they show them kind of going in bed at the same time. And if I'm not mistaken, there was like hundreds of thousands of letters they received for that. Would you agree with me? Times have changed. Wow. What do the righteous do if even the foundations are destroyed? Again, another court case, case this week where they're trying to get prayer out of the city council wanted to pray before their meeting and they're coming against them threatening to sue if they keep on praying like we've done for many, many, many years. And we see all over our society trying to get in God we trust off our coin, getting our pledge of allegiance changed, all these things. The spirit of Antichrist is in our society. President Obama, during his term, declared that this is no longer a Christian nation. And so we are here in a changing time when the very foundations are being destroyed. I remember the simple day when they had a men's restroom and a women's restroom. And it's so crazy, something so simple, something so basic is changing. And so we're living in a different society where the things that are wrong are now right, the things that are right are now wrong. And so I believe we truly live in these last days with the characteristics in our society all around us. Look what it says here, and I want you to write this down. There will be a shaking. There's going to be a shaking that takes place. There will be a shaking, I believe, in our society that we're already seeing. When if you come against something that is so biblically right and a truth out of God's word and you present it to our society, they will rip you apart. And so it is, as we are in this type of society, it is so important to speak about these things. I was talking about before in the thing where the news came out and did a story on us. Uh, when we painted our wall orange, and it was on the news, and I would get calls from different people. And you know what's interesting about that? It's like persecution is happening in 70% of our world. And, and I'll tell you where that safe zone kind of closes up is when there's persecution. <clears throat> When you're in a country and they say, if you don't denounce Jesus Christ, we're going to take your head off. It is a crazy world in which we live. And I tell you, when you see persecution and you see a shaking come to here, how many of you know you either got to get right or you got to get left? And so it is that we talk about this. In fact, one of the ladies of our church, she said, Pastor Brian, boy, if I was in that place, and somebody was going to take my life if I denounced Christ. She said, man, I hope that I can stand up for what is right. She says, teach us how to be strong in those times. Teach us so when those times come that we might be strong. And so this lesson is a little bit about that this morning. Is that you and I would stand up for those things that are right. Because when there is a shaking, I believe it's too late then to make the choice. We need to make it now. Someone says, you know what? Hey, I'm going to live like I want to live. And, you know, live in the rapture. I'm not going to take the mark of the beast. And I'm going to, you know, do this. And I'm going to make the heaven. 
I go, are you crazy? If you can't serve the Lord now with the freedoms we have, what makes you think you're going to do it then? In Hebrews 12, 26 and 27, it says this. And his voice shook the earth then. But now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This expression yet once more denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken as, a crea as of created things, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. There will be a shaking, I believe. During these times, there will be no neutrality. The bad will get worse, but the good will get better. And the question is, what group will you be in? And the good news is you and I get to choose. We get to choose what group we're going to be in. But here's the trick of navigating to be steadfast without being belligerent. Teachable without being gullible. Courageous without sounding arrogant. Righteous without being self-righteous. And so in a message today, we'll be taking and looking at three choices that you and I can make in, in unsettling times. Because you and I need confidence in a shaky world. We need something stronger than ourselves, an anchor, if you will. A navigational point that you and I can align ourselves, and that's why it's so important to come to church. We align ourselves once again with the truth of God's Word in a, in a shakable world. So the first thing I want you to write down as we make good choices is number one, write this down, choose this day who you will serve. Choose this day who you will serve. I'm going to read this in, in the text here of my notes, but I want to read it right here to give you a little bit of a, a background here as Joshua said these very words. And it's interesting to note that what is so relevant about God's word is some of the things that apply all through history apply today. And you'll see it in this text in Joshua 24. And I'm going to read verses 14 and 15. And it says this. Now therefore, Joshua telling the people, they were at a crossroads. He was coming towards the end of his service to the Lord. And it says, now therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt. And serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods of your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, he says, we will serve the Lord. I have this verse written in my house. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. He says, choose this day whom you're going to serve. He says, if you're going to serve the God back in Egypt, and you're going to serve that God, Egypt was symbolic for sin, like sin city, right? For sin. And it was also symbolic of bondage. Because they were in sin and bondage in Egypt. And that's what's symbolic about that in this text and symbolic in our day and age today. Because we can get in all kinds of sins and you're going to end up in bondage. And so you can go that route. You can serve that God if you want to, but you're going to end up in bondage. Or, he says, you're going to serve the God of the Amorites. And the Amorites were in Canaan where they were living. So he says, you can serve that God on the other side of the flood, or the God in Egypt, or you can serve the God of the Amorites. And that is symbolic because that's where they were living. And so that God represents their surroundings. It represents their, their society because that's where they live. We live in a society 
to where he it tries to mold us into a certain image. There is a popular political view that tries to suck people in on a certain side. So what we're seeing in our society is a shift, if you will, of the things that were wrong at one point are now slowly becoming acceptable in our society. So he says, you can serve that God as well. And so you can go with the flow. And I've talked about these illustrations before you put a frog right in a beaker with a Bunsen burner. How many of you did that in college? Three of us. All right. And so you put the frog in there, you put the Bunsen burner, you light it, you turn the flame up. That frog can jump out any time, but it gets used to his surroundings. Right? Because a frog has the ability in his skin to get used to those surroundings. You turn it up, you turn it up, it can start bubbling. He gets used to it, thinks it's a frog jacuzzi. He can jump out any time, but he has the ability to get used to his surroundings, and it ends up destroying him. And so it is with us. You and I know the truth of God's word, but because we live in a society where society accepts it, then therefore, have you ever heard your teenagers say, but everybody's doing it? How many of you know if everybody's doing it doesn't make it right? And so here we are in a dichotomy of living in the world, but called not to be of the world. And so here he says, choose this day whom you will serve. Look what it says in Matthew 24, 1 through 10. At this time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and will mislead many because lawlessness is increased. How many believe really lawlessness is increased? Most people's love will grow cold. I tell you, it's amazing how much lawlessness is out there. Anybody know how many prisons we have in California? California? 41. 34. 34? I, I looked up today and said 41. So either they got... It's on the internet, so it must be true. Anyway. <laughs> but nonetheless, how many of you know there's a lot of prisons out there? And they can't build enough prisons. They can't build enough prisons to hold all the people. Isn't it crazy where our society is going? Because the lawlessness is increased. Because lawlessness is increased, the love of many will wax cold, the King James says. Hmm. See, what happens is because there's so much lawlessness out there, people follow in that lawlessness and their love for the Lord waxes cold. Hmm. Folks, that's why it's so important that we're in God's word, that we know truth and get aligned with God's word. That's why it's so important that we come to, to church to learn the truth of God's word. It is so important. Again, look what Joshua says in 24, 15. If it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve. Whether the gods of your father served, which were beyond the river, the gods of the Amorites whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I believe it's so important that we make that decision every day. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It is so important in our life and in our walk. In May 9th, 1940, Holland declared that they were going to be neutral in World War II. And the very next day, they were taken over. How many of you know the enemy does not care if you if you choose neutrality he just doesn't the same is true in our spiritual life if you choose neutrality you're going to be overtaken by the enemy because he doesn't care and so that's why it's so important that we choose god's way in our life there is sometimes in war called a, a dmz which uh, translates as a demilitarized zone. That does not exist in the battle between
God's kingdom and the battle in this world. And so he says again, choose this day whom you will serve. There's a story about a mother and their daughter, and they would come to church. This little girl learned about the Lord, had a heart for Jesus, will come on Sunday mornings, come on Wednesdays. And her mom loved the Lord, was faithful, and brought her. And when they would come home, the father said, God is not real. Heaven doesn't exist. And he would say that for years. Every time, it's like he resented the fact that they were going to church and would say, God is not real. Heaven doesn't exist. And at 10 years old, she got real sick. She wasn't expected to live, and she's in the hospital, and her dad is there holding her hand. And she said, Dad, I need to know once and for all, is God real? Does heaven exist? She says, which is it? I really need to know. Listen, in the end times, the middle ground, there is no neutral ground. You must choose. You must choose. Everyone who stands before the Lord must choose, and by then it will be too late. The good news is we get to choose now. The Bible says, every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. One day, everyone. Isn't it great to know we get to choose to do that now? To humble ourselves of who we are. Less of me, more Jesus. And it is a struggle. It is a fight. That's where Paul says, fight the good fight of faith. It's, it's a fight to hold on to your faith. And so it is so important that you and I choose the Lord each and every day because that middle ground is going to shrink and it's going to shrink and it's going to shrink. And that's why it's important that you and I choose, and we choose every single day whom you're going to serve. Because the temptation is to serve the God of sin, and you'll end up in bondage, or to serve the God of society, where you kind of blend in with everyone else. And that was the same fight that Joshua experienced back in his day, and things don't change. It's the same fight we experience today. And then number two, the second point is... Choose the posture that you will take. Choose the posture that you will take. When you choose to serve God, what kind of attitude, what kind of posture are you going to take? Look what it says in Ephesians 4.15. He says this, instead, speaking the truth in, say it with me. Love. Let me try that again. Instead, speaking the truth in, Love. we will, in all things, grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. So our posture that we take is not that of judgment, but it is that of love. I can't judge anybody. You can't judge anybody. But we bring them to the Lord. Love does not speak out of ignorance. Love does not speak out of intolerance. He doesn't want us to be enforcers of the kingdom, but he's called us to be ushers into the kingdom. Did you get that? The reason we take, the reason the posture we take is so important is because we don't live in Christian times anymore. We live in a postmodern Christian world, it seems like. I went months ago down in San Luis Obispo on a Thursday, and it was interesting to see this booth that they had there. It was an atheist booth. And to go back months later to see this booth just grow and it's bigger and people are all over that booth. And it always boggles my mind that people would spend their whole lives fighting against the God they don't believe in. 
but it is that spirit that has permeated our society. And if you don't know this, the atheist church is growing by leaps and bounds in our country today. We live in that world. And so the posture we take is so important. We seem to be living in a place that is getting closer and closer to the values of Egypt. What should our posture be? We all know that verse that says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The next verse is on your outline. It's John 3.17. It says, For God did not send his Son into the world to judge the world, that the world might be saved through him. See, here's what happens a lot of time. The church focuses on the wrong thing. They focus on the wrong thing. You can focus on this sin, you can focus on this sin, you can focus on this sin, and you can focus on this sin. How many of you know we all struggle in life? Even your pastor does. I know it's hard to believe. I look good. I smell good. I look perfect. I work out once a month. Anyway, but we all struggle, don't we? We all struggle with those things in our life. The posture we take is so important. So if a guy's in a car accident, he punctured his lung, he's bleeding all to death. You smell all alcohol in his breath and go, oh man, you got a problem. There's alcohol in your breath. <laughs> How many of you know he may have alcohol in his breath, but at that point, that's not the problem. Right. Let me tell you what the problem is. It's not prostitution. It's not drugs. It's not alcohol. It's not this. It's not that. It's not this. You know what it is? It's a separation from Jesus Christ. Right. That's the problem. And the enemy tries to bait people into going that way in Egypt to get them into bondage because it will bring a separation between them and Jesus Christ. That's the problem. True. So you and I are called to be ushers, to usher people. Even our church slogan at Heart of the Valley is connecting hearts to Christ. We all got problems. We all got problems. The greatest problem is when there's a separation between you and Jesus Christ. That's the big problem. And all those other things help to separate us from Jesus Christ. That's why those things are not beneficial. Anything that benefits your relationship with the Lord is beneficial. Keep a close relationship with the Lord. John 3, 19 and 20 says this. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light. For their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for the fear that the deeds will be exposed. There's probably people who are not here in church today because they don't want their deeds exposed. How many of you know we need to come here, get our deeds exposed, so we can come back to Jesus every week right. and every day? No one is above being stupid. It's in our nature. <laughs> That's why we need to be here, amen? amen? In the presence of the Almighty God, sometimes running to the altar, praying, sometimes receiving with a soft heart before the Lord to say, oh man, I need to change that, boy, I need to change that. Boy, I need to start reading more. Boy, I need to be faithful more in church. I need to serve. I need to do all these things. Why? Because you love Jesus. That's all. You love Jesus. Our posture is that of love. And our posture is that of ushering people to Jesus Christ. Because everybody's got a problem. You got a problem. I got a problem. The person sitting next to you has got a problem. Unless it's your wife. No, I'm just kidding. Anyway. <laughs> Some of you woke up. That's the first thing you heard. <laughs> Philippians 2.15 says this. So that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and a perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in this world. I tell you, the darker this world gets, the brighter your light will shine. 
darker this world gets, the brighter our light should shine. We are called to walk in a manner that is worthy of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Mm. And then the last point this morning is choose how you will respond when tested. Choose how you will respond when tested. See, a lot of times we want to look at the storm going around us. I, I love this with, with the testing of Peter's faith. When they're in a boat, they see Jesus coming in the distance and they're freaking out a little bit because they think a ghost is coming on the water towards them. Then he gets closer, they realize it's Jesus. And Peter says, Lord, bid that I can come to you. And Jesus says, Peter, come on out. And Peter begins to walk on the water. How many of you know that would be cool? Right. Yeah. And he's walking on the water and all of a sudden, he takes his eyes off of Jesus and he puts his eyes on the storm below, and Mr. Peter begins to sink. And so we see that you and I are called, even in our testings, to focus on the things of the Lord. Because when we go through adversity, there is advancement, as we talked a little bit last week, there's advancement through adversity, right? The devil's not going to give you a free pass. If you're doing good for the Lord, how many of you know the enemy is going to show right up? And that's why the testing of your faith is so important that when you're going through the testing, you keep your eyes focused on the Lord. So we as a church, usually about 100 people accept the Lord during a year's period of time. We end up baptizing like we did last week. We baptize uh, about 62 people average a year. And those are spiritual things that the Lord is doing in this place. Do you think the enemy enjoys that? No. That's why for a while, some of you know this, we've been broken into 12 times. Then, then somebody donated some cameras to us. They started arresting these guys. It's a crazy thing. And then most of you know, a couple weeks ago, they lit our church on fire and burned the back portion of, of our, our church up. And so what happens is as you're going through a testing, it takes a lot of willpower and it takes a lot of focus in the stresses of life not to focus on those perimeter things, but to stop and focus on Jesus. Amen? Amen. Because in our natural, how many of you live in the natural? How many of you live in this world, woke up this morning? I get that glazed on like it's the craziest thing. See, I'm making sure you're awake. But as we live in this world, the enemy will come against us. The Lord will allow us to go through testing to see what's inside of us, to see the level of faith in which we have. And I said that right from the beginning, our church is going to be way better because of this fire than it was before. We literally had a church on fire. But anyway, we need to get a t-shirt made to that some way. We got a t-shirt guy back there. Anyway. Don't get me started. Here we go. So choose how you're going to respond to when tested. Luke 12, 53 says this. They will be divided. Father against son and son against father. Mother against daughter. Daughter against mother. Mother-in-law against daughter-in-law. And daughter-in-law um, against mother-in-law. And so we see that, that there will be a time when people will hate each other, turn against each other, and be divided. I have never in my entire life seen so much divide in a nation. I have not seen so much hate as you see on the news broadcasting and the crazy violence and the things that are taking place in our society. Would you agree with me on that one? It doesn't take long to turn on your TV and see all the craziness that is going on and the very characteristics that we talked in the very beginning are the characteristics of our society today. How will you respond to that? Well, because lawlessness is there, are you going to respond in a way that weakens your faith? Or are you going to have that foundation of faith and strength that it will make you better? The posture in which we have is that of love. Look what it says in the last verse this morning found in James 1, 2-5. He says this, Consider all joy, my brethren, when you encounter 
encounter various trials. How many of you are going through various trials? Yip, yip, hooray. We're in joy. Mm -hmm. How many of you know it always doesn't seem joyful? How about most of the time it's never joyful? But let me tell you, what is joyful? The Lord is working on you. He loves you so much, he's not going to allow you to remain the same way you are. So we count it all joy when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces, say it with me, endurance. And let your endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. But if any of you lacks wisdom, how many of you lack wisdom? Don't raise your hand. Let him ask of God who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. I tell you, we live in a day and age, and it is so important as we talk about this today, that you and I might be strengthened in our faith to know that the enemy wants to come against us, but we're going to stand strong. The author and the finisher of our faith is on our side. The name that is above all names, the only name by which man can be saved, Jesus Christ. It is the name that every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. We must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of those who what? Seek him, who earnestly seek him. I want to challenge you, seek out the Lord. Amen? Seek out the Lord. I want to challenge you. Choose every single day whom you're going to serve. Every single day, have that posture of love, ushering people. He hasn't called you to be, to be a police in the kingdom. He's called you to be an usher. Usher people to Jesus. Amen. Have that posture of love. And then choose how you're going to respond when tested. The author and the finisher of your faith is on your side. And he's encouraging. The Bible says he lives to and fro. He looks at the heart to see who's following him. And he helps us and gives us strength to those who are, who are truly following him. Amen? Amen. God is so faithful. He loves you. He loves each and every one of us. And I, I want to challenge you. I'm going to invite the worship team to come forward this morning in closing. But I always like to give an opportunity, either me or Pastor Ken, to give an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ. Four people in our first service accepted the Lord today. The Bible says that all heaven rejoices when one person comes to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And I tell you, maybe some of you are here today, maybe you're brand new, and you've never made a decision to choose whom you're going to serve all the days of your life. And I'm gonna give you an opportunity to do that this morning. Would you just bow your heads? I'm going to ask all of you, just repeat this prayer with me and, and pray this with all your hearts. Pray with me, dear Jesus. Everyone, dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Lord, forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And Lord, I invite you into my heart and into my life to be my Lord and my Savior. Lord, I believe you died on the cross and that you rose again. And I accept you now. And in Jesus' name we pray. With every head bowed and every eyes closed, no one looking around, how many say, you know, Pastor Brian, today I chose and I'm choosing to follow Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And I prayed that prayer for the first time and I meant it in my heart. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? Put it right back there. Okay. All right. Any others? Okay. Very good. Very good. Lord, thank you for these who have accepted you. Lord, it is a powerful thing to become a child of the King. Lord, thank you for this service today. And Lord, I would pray for all of us as we live in this last day's chapter. That you would cause us to be strong and cause us to be deliberate in our faith. Deliberate in our walk. 
deliberate with our days that we would follow you. Lord, help us every day to choose you in the midst of a world headed towards Egypt. Lord, we love you. Lord, I thank you that you freely went upon that cross to take the penalty and take the sting of death upon yourself and that all our sins and shame and guilt was nailed upon that cross of Calvary that we can be free because we know whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Lord, help us to come to church, to read your word, to serve, that Lord, each and every time that we are aligning ourselves with you, we're getting corrected, we're getting admonished. Lord, help us to always read the truth of your word. Lord, we thank you for your love, that you loved us so much that you died for this world. Help us to be ushers, to usher people, connect hearts to you, Lord Jesus. We love you. We thank you for this wonderful service that we could come to honor you, to bless you, to come to the altar to pray, to give, to serve. Lord, thank you that you love us so much that we are called the bride of Christ, that you are coming back for us one day. Lord, we love you and we thank you. And in Jesus' name we pray and all God's people say with me, amen. amen. amen.